Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Azvin. I'm the head of uh, security research at BT. And today I would like to talk to you about uh, how we think about cybersecurity and why we need cybersecurity innovation going forward to meet some of the challenges that we are facing. Um, the title of my talk is uh, Future of Cyber Defense, Iron Man or Terminator? And I hope to answer that question at the end of the presentation. Now, cybersecurity is one of the greatest man-made challenges of our time. Uh, it's probably right up there with climate change. It's something that we've created. It didn't exist 20, 30 years ago. And uh, it's both a challenge and an opportunity. Um, so every day we see attacks on uh, hospitals and businesses and uh, financial institutions. Um, this is... Uh, a costing business a huge amount of money, costing governments a lot of money and so on. And that creates an opportunity for people uh, and companies to innovate and try to come up with solutions around the problems we've created based on uh, advanced technology and so on. And that, those are some of the things that I want to talk about later in, in the talk. Um, there are a few problems that we have in terms of dealing with cyber attacks. One of the key problems is that we're not very good at uh, responding to attacks. So on average, it takes us about 31 days to um, uh, clean up the operation after a cyber attack. And that's almost like, you know, after a burglary, you take 31 days to change the locks in, in your house. And clearly that's not uh, an acceptable situation. So, you know, how do, we, how do we become better at dealing with attacks is part of the problem. Um, in a recent survey, um, it, it was shown that uh, healthcare organizations are top of the list in terms of uh, uh, targets of cyber attacks. And we've had in the uh, last few months an attack on our NHS, and we all understand the implications of, uh, uh, of uh, operations being canceled and so on. And, uh, and uh, so this is uh, something that we need to deal with, and it's, it's going to affect our lives more and more as we move forward. Um, cybersecurity is hard for two reasons, primarily. One reason is that the hackers, the bad guys, are getting better at what they do. Um, and uh, this, this uh, illustration shows the kind of weapons that the bad guys are using to attack organizations and people. And there's an evolution of these weapons. So we move from, say, viruses in the 1990s to worms. Uh, uh, worms are malware that do not require a host, for example, and they could uh, find their way through the infrastructure of organizations. So, for example, the recent NHS attack was of the uh, warm type, and it actually uh, spread very, very rapidly within the computers in the NHS. They're more difficult to deal with than viruses, um, um, but they're not new. They've been around since uh, 2000, 2005. And then uh, the weapons sort of morphed into things like spyware and ransomware, clearly ransomware, malware that takes over your um, photos and, and data and uh, requires a ransom to uh, um, give you a key to unlock those. Um, a lot of people pay ransomware. They, they, the way to deal with ransomware is to back up your stuff so that if you're, you lose your control of your data on your hard disk, you still have backups and you don't need to hopefully pay the ransom. And then later on, we'll see, uh, we've, we're beginning to see things like APTs, and these stand for Advanced Persistent Threats. Now, APTs are um, very sophisticated. They're designed often by hacktivists or, um, you know, governments sometimes, and they are very targeted um, and very difficult to stop. And so when we talk about cyber defense, we're talking about how to defend against all of these different types of um, uh, weapons or, or malware that are being uh, invented almost on a um, you know day-to-day -day basis. Um, so just to give you some idea of what we're dealing with, over the last six months in BT, we've seen a 1,000% uh, increase in the number of threats that 
we've detected on our network. Every month we clean about two million types of malware on our network. We deal with about five million uh, suspected attacks and 250,000 actual attacks. Um, and so this is why um, cybersecurity is hard because you're uh, dealing with a moving um, target in terms of what you're defending against and the uh, criminals, the hacktivists are getting far more organized than they used to be. So um, if you look at what the challenges are in the, in, in the near term, Clearly, some of them are due to technology, and I'll talk about that in detail a little bit later on. But some of them are, are about people. I mean, we, we also need to change the behavior of people to make the cyber attacks less likely. Um, you have, I'm sure, heard of phishing attacks, for example. These are um, emails that uh, come from usually either somebody you know or somebody who... Uh, uh, is offering you some reward in return for helping them. And uh, they seem very obvious. They usually uh, uh, carry an incentive, like uh, you've won an, uh, a massive uh, award or prize uh, in a lottery, and all you need to do is uh, provide your bank details for the criminals to give you, the, give you that prize. Or uh, it's usually a, a link in an email that says, well, you know, I've come across this thing that you find very interesting. Would you mind uh, uh, clicking on it? And I'm sure most of you wouldn't click on, on that email. But there are some alarming statistics which says that 90% of these very simple attacks have at least one victim. 23% uh, of, of uh, people who receive them open them. 11% uh, click on a link in the email. And 85% of cyber attacks start that simple, you know. So although I'm going to focus a lot on technology, it's not just about technology. It's also about educating people and changing our behavior, becoming a little bit more uh, careful in our attitude online and to emails. And in the near future, these same kind of things will happen with SMS, social media, and so on and so forth. So that said technology is important and one of the worrying trends that we see is that um, cyber security is isn't just about information security anymore um, it's not about loss of information it's not about people uh, stealing your data but it is about uh, physical attacks on infrastructure um, and the reason for this is because we have, uh, through the, ad, the invent of the internet, we have come up with very sophisticated ways to monitor our infrastructure, um, to make sure that the infrastructure is working properly and so on. But this connection of infrastructure to the internet uh, creates a, a huge vulnerability, um, which means that someone from the other side of the world could attack your physical infrastructure. So when your traffic lights, for example, are connected to the internet, somebody could hack into the traffic lights and change them from the other side of the world. When your uh, chemical plants or oil refineries are connected to the internet, somebody could disrupt the operations. When car plants are connected to the internet, uh, they could be disrupted. The process of, 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 of production of cars could be um, disrupted by attacks. And so what we're seeing is uh, this kind of cyber physical attacks, which are attacks that start in cyberspace but actually impact the physical world. And we've seen some examples of this in terms of water purification plants and uh, critical national infrastructure attacks around the world. And so, you know, it's not just about losing information, serious as it may in terms of information, but it's, it's really about protecting our physical world as well. You could imagine that if the wrong type of people, wrong group have this capability, they could do a huge amount of damage uh, by just changing the traffic lights, um, turning them all green or turning them all red or something more sophisticated. So 
you know, we really need to think very deeply about how do we secure our critical infrastructure. And one of the things that um, I have uh, talked about over the, num over the last few years is that it's not just about, um, you know, putting protection, layers of protection in uh, your uh, IT systems, but it's really about fundamentally changing the way you think about cybersecurity. And here I'm, I'm using uh, a uh, fruit analogy of coconuts and avocados. And when you talk to a lot of companies today, their way of thinking on security is, is very much like a coconut, which is we've got some valuable assets inside our organization. We need a very hard shell around those assets. And once we have the hard shell, we are fine. We are safe. Well, as I explained before, because the hackers and hacktivists are getting more and more sophisticated, the shell uh, is not protecting everything. That's why we see so many cyber attacks. So the shell has holes in it, or the bad guys are already inside the coconut. So it doesn't matter if you make the shell thicker and thicker, they're already inside. So it's not really a very good way of thinking about security. The way you should be thinking about security is more like an avocado. Now, with an avocado, you've got a hard center and slightly softer outside with the skin. And the avocado analogy is useful because it tells you that you can't protect everything to the same level. There are certain things that are important to you, that are critical, that are your core assets. And you need to protect those with a very hard shell, which is the stone in the middle of the avocado. So what organizations need to do is to say, here are my top 50, top 100, top 500 assets, and I want to put a double, triple layer of protection around those to make them very unattractive, very difficult to break into. But also recognize that you cannot protect all your assets to the same level. And that's the outside of the avocado. So you can protect some things really, really well, but you can't protect everything to the same level because then you'll be in the coconut model, which means that you're spreading your resources too thinly and you're protecting everything very badly, basically. So the question then is, in the avocado world, how do you protect the stuff that is non-critical? And the, uh, the way you do that is by moving away from what I call prevention-based approach to security to um, complementing that with detection and prediction and then also response. So let me give you an example of this. So let's say that you're a really good um, um, organization from a security perspective and you stop 90% of all the attacks on your organization. 10% will get through. So what do you do with that 10%? Well, if you could detect or predict the 10%, then you could uh, act very quickly to limit the damage and so on. So, you know, the avocado model is, as soon as someone tries to get into th the avocado through the skin, if you can detect that, you could prevent it. You could stop them from getting further into your critical assets. Um, and that's called sort of detection and, and prediction. And there's a lot of innovation in that area, which I'm going to come to a, a little bit later. So you've got your prevention, and that's a bit like having good doors and locks in your house. Then you've got your detection and prediction. That's a bit like having a burglar alarm and a police response system. Now, what if they get through all of that, right? That's where you need a rapid response uh, uh, approach which means that instead of taking 31 days, which is what usually takes to respond to cyber attacks, taking minutes or even seconds. And there's some technology that can help us do that. Um, so a lot of research uh, in the last few years, including the research in my team, has been focusing on how do you build really good prevention uh, systems around security, but how do you complement that with very advanced detection and prediction and where we're going in the future is how do you actually automate the response to an attack so that you could press a button and the organization is uh, changed in such a way that the uh, impact of an attack is minimized. Um, 
within, you know, within minutes or within seconds. So that's one thing I want to focus on. If you remember, I said there are two reasons why cybersecurity is really difficult. One reason is that the hackers are getting very good at what they do, and they are uh, launching uh, new types of attacks and inventing new weapons. But the second reason why they are so good, um, cybersecurity is so difficult, is that the rate of adoption of new technology has changed such that we're all adopting technology much faster than before. So, you know, um, if, for example, in the 1970s and 1980s, we had like 10 years to launch a product, these days, products are launched within months or days, and people are using these kind of products and services very, very quickly. And that introduces a challenge in terms of security, because we haven't got enough time to design security into what we're using or what we're selling. So technology presents a challenge, but also an opportunity. And here I'm uh, focusing on four technologies and the impact of those technologies are on, uh, on security. And I want to just say a few words about each, each one of them. Starting from quantum computing. Now quantum computing is going to revolutionize um, almost all aspects of computing today. Quantum computers uh, rely on um, encoding information based on quantum properties of uh, um, light particles. And uh, what this allows us to do is to encode a vast amount of information in one quantum bit. Um, the net result of this is that quantum computers will be about 100 million times faster than today's computers. Now that's great news if you are a, uh, if you are a uh, researcher looking for a uh, cure for cancer or if you are uh, looking at uh, finding life in outer space, you know, computationally hard problems because you can solve them in a fraction of the time. So the example I have here is something that takes a thousand years today would take two and a half minutes for a quantum computer. But the bad news is that um, majority of the encryption systems, so these are systems that protect your data when it goes from A to B, are based on um, what we call classical encryption techniques. And these classical encryption techniques rely on the fact that it's very, very difficult to break them using conventional computers. So it takes thousands of years for a conventional computer to guess the key to break the communication between uh, two points. And that's good enough because nobody's going to spend, you know, 10,000 years uh, trying to break into uh, our networks. But when quantum computers uh, come around, some people will spend days or months or minutes to actually break them. So it, it makes the existing encryption techniques uh, obsolete. So what we're doing here is we're looking post-quantum. We're, th we're thinking you know, and, and we're not alone, there's a lot of companies who are doing this thinking, okay, if uh, a quantum computer becomes available, how do we protect our information? How do we protect our networks? And one of the uh, pioneering pieces of work that we've done is uh, uh, we've said, okay, so let's use quantum uh, properties themselves to create uh, ways of encrypting data uh, because by definition, uh, quantum properties are um, um, unbreakable in the sense that if you um, create some encryption keys using quantum properties and if somebody hacks into your network to read those keys, the uh, fundamental laws of physics tell you that the quantum properties change. So it's impossible to measure a quantum property um, without changing the, the actual quantum signal, and we're using that to create something called uh, quantum key distribution, and uh, this is something that uh, is one example of how we could protect information in a post-quantum world, but there's a, there's a lot of work around quantum safe cryptography. There are some classical techniques where we could um, uh, prove the um, um, encryption of, of data, uh, even uh, in the presence of very, very fast quantum computers. And that's work that we've undertaken um, 
uh, recently. So let me move on to uh, another area which is going to fundamentally change uh, a lot of things we, we do, and this is called the Internet of Things, or the IoT. Yeah. Um, now, IoT is, uh, is um, going to change our cities. Uh, you've heard of things like smart cities, smart hospitals, smart cars, uh, smart homes, um, and um, IoT is basically the idea that everything can be connected. Anything can be connected. Uh, so you could have very small sensors giving you signals on roads, you could have uh, medical equipment that communicate with each other and communicate with the, uh, with, with the cloud, sending information about you know, your health, for example. You could have um, um, bins, even people talk about smart bins, bins that send a signal when they're full, so people collect them and people collect the rubbish and, and uh, it improves the uh, hygiene of, of cities and so on. So there's a lot of really, really good ideas in there. Um, but what uh, IoT does is that it creates a massive challenge for, from a security perspective, because how do you know these things are secure? So um, uh, some, some talks I give uh, to audiences, I, I talk about uh, s uh, pet cams, for example. People buy cams, that uh, cameras that they put in their house to monitor their pets when they're not around um, to make sure that the pets are okay. Now, I would advise people to make sure that these uh, cameras are secure because, uh, you know, obviously not many people are interested in your pets but if somebody hacks into these pet cams, they could very easily find out when you're not home and even when you are home, what you're up to. And this is something that people don't think about. So what we see in the IoT space is that there's a lot of products that sound great, but they haven't been designed with security in mind. And um, some of the recent uh, IoT examples are in the sort of connected car area, right? Now, connected cars are um, uh, safety critical systems, right? If somebody hacks into your car while you're driving down the motorway and activates the brake, that would worry you. Um, and uh, and so, so the question is how do you secure them? Just so that you don't think that um, this is theoretical, I have a, a demonstration of uh, a hacker hacking into a car under controlled conditions which you might find interesting. So I'd like to play that. Um. This is a regular new car. The masking tape is only there because we agreed to obscure its make and model. We'll give them the illusion they control the car for now. Kaufman has been working on this for five years with multiple research teams. Can I hit the fluids? Oh my gosh. There we go. There we go. What's that? What's that? What's that? <laughs> That's, yeah, the windshield wiper fluid. <laughs> no, wait. Is, is, so this is something that a hacker hit. <laughs> That's right. A hacker. Like, obviously, you didn't turn on the windshield I did wiper. Not. <laughs> Using a laptop, the hacker dialed the car's emergency communication system and transmitted a series of tones that flooded it with data. As the car's computer tried sorting it out, the hacker inserted an attack that reprogram the software, gaining total remote control. Uh, oh my God! The <laughs> They're doing that. They're doing the they could control uh, the pet, the gas, the acceleration. They could control the braking. That's right. And they could do this from anywhere in the world. So just try, uh, stop at the cones here. She thinks she's going to be able to stop right at those cones. Let's make sure that she can't. She's going to drive right through them. Right. We'll have complete control of that brake. All right, here we go. Oh, no, 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 I cannot, support, right? oh my God, I can't operate the brakes at all, oh my word, that is frightening, that is frightening. Clearly something we should, we should think about, and, and there's a lot of research going on into how do you secure uh, things that are connected to the internet, and um, um, this is just a connected car. Recently, we've heard stories about smart cars that drive themselves, self-driving cars and so on. And so that is a, even more cause for concern. Um, 
Now, smart cars use something uh, called AI, artificial intelligence, and I'm going to come to that in, in a minute. Um, but let me, let me uh, talk about big data a little bit. Uh, we've all heard of big data. Um, great idea in terms of uh, storing vast amounts of information and getting knowledge out of that information, you know, mining that uh, data at a fraction of the cost. Uh, so making, making it more accessible um, and available to a much larger uh, uh, population of scientists and, and engineers and, and, um, and data analysts. Um, the problem with big data is that you know, a lot of people say data is the most valuable asset of an organization. And when you put all your valuable assets in one place, it makes it the target. So the question for us in terms of cybersecurity is how do you actually um, protect that data? So there's a lot of work around encryption of large volumes of data. Um, and uh, you should always think about uh, what happens if that data is breached, right? When you put all your valuable assets in one place, it makes it a target and you should be thinking about that. So there's a lot of research around how do you encrypt large volumes of data and then decrypt it at a speed that's still usable. Um, but the opportunity on the other side of big data is that, um, if you remember, I talked about detection and prediction. Now, in the, uh, before the advent of big data, detection and prediction was based on samples. So if you had a cyber attack and you hadn't detected it, uh, unless that cyber attack was represented in the sample of data that you could store, you wouldn't be able to analyze it. Now, with big data, it's possible to analyze all of the data that you have in your, your organization. So it's much more difficult for criminals to hide behind large volumes of data because you could store it and you could um, uh, analyze it and find out what's going on. And so that's where the big opportunity for big data is, and this is where... Uh, we are using big data to uh, look at needle in the needle stack, you know, so most cyber attacks are, you know, one, in, one uh, um, um, incident, one event in hundreds of millions of events that you see on, on the internet. So big data allows us to be able to do that um, without having to sample the data to make it uh, uh, computationally um, uh, possible. Now, I want to now focus on AI. So um, now AI is going to have a fundamental impact on our lives in the next half a century, in my view. Um, it is already having impact on our lives in the short term, but I think it's going to have a step change in terms of what we can do with, with AI systems. And what I want to focus on here is... Uh, the opportunity that AI offers. Now, there's a lot of negative stories about AI, about AI taking over the world and robots, uh, you know, getting rid of humans and killing us and so on and so forth. Now, I think that's mostly driven by journalists and um, and science fiction movies. I mean, very imaginative kind of of AI systems. But I have been working in AI for the last 25 years, and I see more good than bad in terms of AI technology. And I want to focus on that um, uh, over the next uh, 10 minutes or so. And um, if you think about AI, you could think about AI in two fundamentally different ways. So the way I've done this slide, I've deliberately uh, looked at AI uh, on the right-hand side primarily focused on replacing people. If you think about that, it's all about building things that look like people that can replace people, right? But in the bottom left, you see AI systems that help people or enhance people's capabilities, right? Now you're beginning to realize why I called my uh, talk uh, Iron Man or Terminator, the future of cyber defense, right? So the Iron Man model of AI is that you have a human at the center and you create a superhuman by using AI, right? The Terminator model of AI is that you could actually do everything that humans do with a robot that looks like a human and you don't need humans then, clearly, right? So the question is, uh, what, which model is going to help us in security? And I want to spend a little bit of time on that. 
Now, by the way, I mean, it doesn't have to be science fiction. The AI that enhance our capabilities are already here. So you have got things like Siri and Alexa. You can ask questions and they can answer those questions and so on. And so you almost have systems that help you, um, but they're doing some kind of uh, rudimentary uh, work right now. And the question is, can we use these systems or something similar to them in uh, helping us uh, in our cyber defense? So let's look at the sort of state of the art in terms of AI and machine learning. And it's, a lot of it is, is about machine learning. So the, the most significant advances over the last uh, you know, 15, 20 years have been in the area of machine learning, and um, particularly around neural networks. So this is an example of a, of a paper that describes a convolutional neural network that has been trained to um, describe what's in a picture. Right? So this, is, uh, uh, this has been trained by a very large number of pictures with captions. So you basically feed the captions and feed the picture, and then you train the neural network to associate the picture with captions. Then you test it, and this is a test with a new picture, and you, you present this picture to it, and it comes back with the explanation on the right, which says, a group of people shopping an out, at an outdoor market, and there are many vegetables at the fruit stand. Now that's pretty good for an AI system, right? Given that you've done virtually nothing other than give it examples, it's pretty good, right? But is it good enough? Is it good enough? Uh, so there are examples where AI systems get things wrong. So Again, statistically, they're very good, so they're 99% accurate. But in the occasion when they're not accurate, they give you a conclusion which is, you know, not very accurate. A young boy is holding a baseball bat. Clearly, this is not a baseball bat. So in a security uh, setting, this might be identified as a threat, which it isn't. Um, and so that's not really acceptable. And, AI systems also make um, some silly mistakes, like they don't understand context. They understand, you know, what they've been trained to understand, but they don't really have common sense. So this is an example where uh, our beloved uh, Siri um, is going to get it wrong. Now, we don't worry about this. Why don't we worry about this? Uh, well, because we ignore it. We are humans. We understand this is stupid they say don't be stupid don't do this or you know you override it um, apart from AI systems getting it wrong which is a problem AI systems uh, can be fooled right so uh, there, there's a whole area of research called adversarial examples where you um, train an AI system with some data in this case it's a, uh, a network that's uh, designed to recognize animals you present a picture of an animal, it tells you what it is. So you present it with this, and it tells you it's a panda. And it has 58% confidence in that prediction. Which is not bad, you could live with that, right? This is a panda, and it's almost 60% accurate, that's fine. Then you add a very small amount of noise to that picture, which results in the picture on the right. And then you present it to the same machine learning system, neural network, and it says that's a gibbon, and I'm pretty sure it's a gibbon. All right? So, to a human, that's obvious. This is not a gibbon. This is still the same panda, and in fact, you know, there's virtually no, no difference between the two of them. Um, so, when we started looking at how we use AI for cybersecurity, we very quickly came up with this idea that actually it's not AI that we need, it's IA. It's the Iron Man version of, uh, because in all of those examples, if there was a human in the loop, you wouldn't make the mistake, right? I mean, in the Siri example, there is a human in the loop, right? So you'd say, no, I don't want you to call me an ambulance. I want you, I want you to call me an ambulance. I don't want you to call me ambulance. So that is uh, the human in the loop correcting an AI system. And that's what we call intelligence augmentation. So can we design systems that cooperate 
and augment human capability rather than replace them. Now, of course, it's easier said than done, right? In the case of Iron Man, it's science fiction. <laughs> you could do that. How do you do it in the context of a corporate network with cybersecurity? How do you get AI systems to help humans communicate with them and humans to communicate back to AI systems? This is where we had a uh, uh, eureka moment, you know, about six, seven years ago. We said, why don't we just use visualization? Why don't we get these algorithms to present what they're doing to humans and then humans just click on what makes sense to them, right? So we use very simple interfaces to get AI systems to collaborate, cooperate with humans. So we built this system. It's won lots of national and international awards. And it was so good uh, that it was used during the London 2012 Olympics. And it was very successful. But we hadn't even started putting the AI in there yet. And it was very successful because it's so simple to use. So how does this system work? Well, it's based on the fact that you want to visualize the result of analysis as soon as possible. So here is a scenario where bad guys are trying to break into our network. So it's a malware. Um, it's measuring what malware is trying to get into our network. And what we're doing here, we're using very simple uh, color scheme. We say red's bad, green is good. Red is the computer or the origin of malware, and green is destination. So green is our machines, and red is the bad guys, right? So you see at 620 down there, something happens. The, the analyst is rerunning the data. This is how easy it is. It's almost like a game. The analyst is running the data. This machine 8.90.8, which is in the UK, you can see it on the map, is trying to send malware to a lot of our machines. And suddenly at 6.20 something happens. A part of the um, innovation behind this kind of systems is that it's very easy for humans to see that. Right? Where if you're looking at hundreds of millions of data points, you can't see that. It's very easy to miss that. So in this case, what the system allows the analyst to do and imagine there's an analyst in front here, you know, that they're running the, the show here. It says, okay, there is a dodgy machine in the UK that's sending malware to a lot of our machines. And suddenly at 620, those number of machines increase. You can actually see the spike on the top right screen, which shows the number of connections. And so this is worrying. Why is a suspicious machine in the UK doing this? So the analyst starts um, investigating further. And in this case, you need more data. You, don't, you just don't have enough data. You go and fetch more data. And you rerun that analysis. What you will see is that actually, there are more bad guys than you thought. And they're not all in the UK. In this case, they are uh, somewhere in China. So the story here is that there was, there's a botnet in China. That botnet had taken control of this machine to do the initial analysis of our network. It found a few vulnerabilities. Once the vulnerabilities were found, that machine sent the information to the uh, command and control center in, in this case, China. And then uh, now they take over and start spreading malware through our network. Um, now, as it turns out, actually, it's not just in China. There's also a botnet in uh, California that they are taking control of. And within three minutes, the analyst, because this is so simple, is able to deal with this. Because we know where it's coming from. We know which machines are involved. We know which machines are targeted. That's the end of story as far as security of, you know, of this incident is, is concerned. Now. Once we knew that this worked and the analysts liked to do this, then we said, okay, so let's put the AI in it, right? Let's, let's get the AI involved. Um, so that was some clever analytics. Now let's get the AI involved. Now, what you see on the right-hand side is what we call clustering, which is unsupervised machine learning. It's, a, it's the hardest form of machine learning. Basically, what it is is that we throw 
all the data into an AI system and say, organize it for me. It's clustering. And the AI system looks at similarities. So it says, okay, these things are similar. You can see some clusters. And in fact, the AI system would find the same botnet much quicker uh, based on the outliers. So um, if you start with this picture and then you focus on what the AI system has found, you will see that that anomaly is found much, much more quickly than uh, it would have done without the machine learning aspect, right? So, as you can see, it's quite an interactive system. So we, we had a sort of first step towards that um, uh, Iron Man, you know, where AI is working with humans. Humans love visualization. Um, we then had to do some clever uh, um, processing in the back end to make this visually interesting using colors and shapes and so on. And now we're presenting that and humans are feeding that back. And the process of finding these anomalies is almost like a hunting process where you start off with something that interests you and then you sort of follow that through and then find something that leads to a you know, stopping of a cyber attack. So that's one example. The other example is that system was very successful. It's, it's something that we're using now in our own security operations center and something that we're making available to, uh, to, uh, uh, to our customers as well. This is another example where we're going much deeper into our network. And here what we're saying is that um, can an AI system tell us what looks odd on our network so that uh, our analysts can focus their attention on that? The problem that we're trying to solve here is that the analysts in security operations centers who are monitoring and, and trying to detect attacks are overloaded, right? And this is an example of uh, a very small amount of data that they're presented with. This is five minutes of data on 9,000 devices. Clearly, you can't see anything here, right? It's, it's all over the place. So we apply AI, and it turns it into this. How do we do that? Now, remember, that was five minutes for 9,000 devices. This is five hours over 200,000 devices, much bigger volume of data. And what we do here is we get the AI system to learn what normal behavior is, and then tell us what is an anomaly which is these kind of spikes coming out of the center. It's continuously learning the center, and it's presenting those spikes. And what uh, the Iron Man, remember the Iron Man analogy, what the analyst is doing now is saying, well, actually, I want to investigate these five anomalies, bringing his or her knowledge into this, saying, these are the anomalies I want to find. And again, you run that through the system, it comes up with some stuff that is not an anomaly, but the analyst knows that, and some stuff down here, which looks very strange. Again, the AI has separated those. You put a box around that, you say, okay, give me more information on that, and hey, presto. What we found in vast amount of data, uh, seven suspicious machines. This is, again, seven machines that are trying to infect our systems with malware that um, quite, quite, quite easily could be hidden inside much, much larger volumes of data. Um, so, you know, these are, these are experiments around what we're doing. Uh, this is another example of how AI can help us with uh, a serious problem, and this is to do with um, Bitcoin. You've heard of Bitcoin, clearly. Uh, hopefully some of you have some Bitcoins, uh, and I would like to talk to you about that uh, afterwards. <laughs> but um, sadly, I never bought any Bitcoins, and um, I, I, I still think it's going gonna, it's gonna to go to zero <laughs> very soon. But anyway, uh, the bad side of Bitcoin is that criminals use it as payments for ransomware, right? And this is an example of um, transactions on the Bitcoin network um, after a ransomware attack. And what you see on the left-hand side is the raw transactions. What you see on the right-hand side is the um, clustering of those transactions based on some knowledge that we have about uh, some criminal activity on the Bitcoin network. And 
what we did was we used this for an investigation, a real investigation, and within three hours we were able to identify a number of individuals who were uh, benefiting from this ransomware. And this is a kind of thing that you know, the uh, law enforcement agencies are doing continuously. But again, we've shown that with AI and with some machine learning, you could um, you know, make this channel redundant for the criminals because you know, if they can't take the money out, there's no point for them to um, demand ransom and, and, and so on and, and demand payment in Bitcoin. So let's look a little bit further into the future. So this Iron Man analogy is working for us and is producing some innovations that's helping us make our network safer. So let's go a little bit further into the future. And you know, what is really important is for humans and machines to work seamlessly together. So we're working on some advanced interfaces using, using uh, devices like a leap motion sensor here. A leap motion sensor is a small device you put next to your computer. It can detect the end of your fingers. And it's a, you can program it to have very rich interactions. So every finger turns into a mouse, for example. And you could program it to recognize almost sign language. And what we're doing here, we're experimenting with this. Um, the reason for this is because we envisage a situation in the future where uh, you know, a number of humans stand in front of a big screen solving the problem, hunting the bad guys. And we want to make that as, as uh, transparent and as uh, natural as possible. So you may remember the movie Minority Report where uh, Tom Cruise is, uh, is standing in front of a big screen and doing the kind of investigation. That's the kind of thing that we want to be able to do with, with more people. Um, we couldn't afford Tom Cruise, so uh, I'm here instead. But, uh, but the idea is that you, will, uh, um, uh, you don't need to train people to use this. You, know, you get people from network side, the customer service side, security side, all collaborating, injecting their knowledge, interacting with the back-end AI systems to solve problems in a matter of minutes rather than weeks and um, months. Um, and of course, these days, you have to have a virtual version of that, virtual reality. And although this looks very nice and uh, it's, uh, the audiences love it, there's a very good reason why we're doing this because it's very difficult to get all the experts into one room to do the analysis. We have 16 security operation centers around the world, you know, ranging from the Australian ones to the USA, to Europe and to, to Far East. And so it's important for these analysts to be able to collaborate in a virtual space. Um, you know, attacks don't wait for people to wake up and, and so on. So you need to get these teams together and start the analysis very quickly. So some of the things we're working with are creating virtual environments where um, you could do um, similar kind of analysis. Again, in a very immersive virtual environment in real time um, to, to, to tackle some of the um, really sophisticated attacks that, that we see on our, on our, on our network. So in conclusion, I would like to uh, say that there's a lot of uh, uh, research done in AI around the world um, to address some of the shortcomings that I described in my talk. Um, one of those initiatives is XAI, Explainable AI. Um, and the objective of this uh, research is to uh, build AI systems that can not only give you the answer, but explain why. Um, so for example, on the left, you'll see an, uh, an AI system that identifies a cat. Um, but explainable AI would go further than that and would say why it thinks it's a cat. Because it has uh, fair and whiskers and claws and it has pointy ears. And that's where you get more confidence in terms of what the AI system is telling you. And in terms of security, what we are looking for is instead of AI systems coming up with the answer and say, there is a malware in your computer. What we want is to tell us why it thinks it's malware, maybe because it's acting in a strange way, maybe because it's uh, um, copying lots of sensitive information and sending it to suspicious locations on the internet. Um, and by the way, uh, we need to know how serious that threat is. So it needs to tell us, you know, if you don't act within a few minutes, uh, what will happen. And even going further than that, uh, we need AI systems that can actually take action uh, based on uh, 
uh, what we want. So, you know, do you want me to deal with it? You know, do you want me to remove the malware or stop the uh, network or update the firewall and so on and so forth? So th that, that's the kind of AI system that uh, most of the researchers in AI are, are working towards. And I want to leave you with a, with a quote from um, attributed to Albert Einstein. And I really believe in this, that the future is about uh, AI systems, computers working with humans, enhancing them, uh, enhancing their capabilities rather than replacing them. And um, so going back to the title of my presentation, I believe the answer is firmly Iron Man type of AI rather than Terminator. Thank you very much.